Wesley Public Library. I'm David Distelhorst, your local history librarian. Thank you for joining us to, for tonight's program, a preview of the homes on this year's Bexley Women's Club Home and Garden Tour. Before we get started, a few notes on how this hybrid program will work. After the presentation, there will be time for Q&A. For those joining us virtually, please submit your questions at any time via the Zoom chat function, and we will relay those to our presenters. For those joining us in person, we will have a microphone for you so that those joining virtually can hear you. This program is being recorded and will be made available um, via Bexley Public Library's YouTube page. And now a few words about our speakers. Amy Lauerhouse, owner of Lauerhouse Architecture, specializes in renovations and additions of older homes in Bexley, Upper Arlington, Westerville, Clintonville, Grandview Heights, and Worthington. She attended the University of Cincinnati, where she received her Bachelor of Architecture in 1995 and her architecture license in 1998. After 19 years with a small residential design firm, she established Lauer House Architecture in 2014. Amy's experience is with residential design of all scopes, from front porches to large new homes. David Distors is originally from Columbus before moving to St. Louis and then Shaker Heights, Ohio with a Bachelor of Arts in Visual Communication from Ohio University. He was a photojournalist at newspapers across Ohio before attending Kent State University for his Master of Library and Information Science. He has been a local history librarian in Ohio for six years. And the tour is coming up on Sunday, June 4th. Tickets are available at the Bexley Women's Club website, Grader's Ice Cream, and Johnson's Ice Cream and the funds support scholarships awarded by the Bexley Women's Club. All right, good evening, welcome everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the architecture of all the homes on the tour, and David's going to give you some fun facts about the history of the homes on the tour. Um, one thing I wanted to start with, and this may look familiar for anyone that's attended in the past, is uh, figuring out a house style isn't always as simple as it seems. Uh, these are the table of contents in the book that I use most often when I'm working to prepare this presentation. A field guide to American house styles, which uh, I have here if you want to look at it, and David told me that they have it available in the library as well. These are all of the main architectural home styles in America. And you can see here, uh, I have a poster that breaks them down visually for you. Uh, and even when you get to that point, it still can be confusing about um, what style it is. For instance, someone may say, I have a colonial house. There's original colonial from 1600 to 1820. There's Colonial Revival from 1880 to 1940, and there's Neo-Colonial or New Traditional Colonial that's been since 1935. And even across different books, people disagree on years and terminology, so it, it can be a little tricky, but it's a lot of fun for me to kind of dig into each of these houses and see uh, what they have to offer. My husband and daughter have told me that sometimes I use architectural terms that everyone may not know. So I, I am making a better effort this year and in, in, in following years to add a little bit of architectural terminology uh, into the presentation of terms that are most often used in houses and terms that my own clients sometimes don't know uh, what they mean. So this is uh, one example of that. Um, you can see the gable roof in the top left. That's one of the most common forms of roof structures. Below that is the hip roof, where the roof basically slopes on all four sides. Um, you can see the salt box below that that's uneven. Um, the gambrel roof, most people will call that a barn style roof. Uh, um, and then there's some others that are a little bit more complicated, but this at least gives you an idea of the main 
kinds of roof structures that you will see in pretty much all the homes here across Bexley. Also, when it comes to architectural terms, a lot of people don't understand the terminology for windows and for the um, where your walls meet your roof. And I think it's helpful when, not only if you want to do a renovation, but if you're talking to uh, wanting to replace your windows or uh, you need to talk some, to somebody about your gutters, uh, that it's helpful to have the correct terminology. So one of the things that's probably most often messed up is muttons versus mullions. Um, so muttons are the, the small pieces that separate the actual glass panes. Historically, those would have separated actual panes. Now they're just for decoration because we do insulated glass. So they can be between the glass, they can be on one side or the other or both. A, a mullion is a thicker piece that separates two windows and that's a structural piece. So those would be two separate window units that they would install with a structural piece in the middle. Um, the sashes for a double hung is a double, this, these are double hung windows, so the sashes move independently. Um, and then a casement window is the kind that you crank in and out. Um, and then they have a couple things about the trim as well. On the intersection of your roof and wall, this also gets confused a lot. Um, the soffit is the underside here of the portion of the roof that sticks out over the wall. A lot of people, or everyone should, but a lot of old homes don't have venting in there. Um, the fascia is the piece that sits behind the gutter, so this doesn't show your gutter, but that's where it would sit right there, and that's the fascia board. This whole piece is called the eave, and then a lot of our homes have a beautiful molding here where the roof meets the soffit. Um, that's called a cornice, and then the frieze trim is trim that is directly applied to the wall face. Um, and then rake, the rake is the side of the gable ends. So here you would have trim up the sides if, you, if your home has a gable. Um, and that end is called the rake portion. Um, so again, to help everybody kind of underst understand some basic terminology. Another very confusing thing to a lot of my clients is dormers. Um, there are Dormers are projections off of your roof that include windows. Um, there are three different kinds. The most common kind is a roof dormer where it fully sits on the roof and a little piece of roofing comes in front of it. That's the most traditional kind. Um, there is a wall dormer where the wall goes straight up onto the window. Not quite as common because for those of us pragmatic architects, it makes gutters very difficult. Um, and then you have an inset where the dormers sort of push back a little bit in the roof and you have a little, uh, little flat or, or barely sloping piece of roof here. Um, sometimes those insets are very deep, sometimes they're not deep at all. Uh, that's a little tricky too because that area can be a potential water leak. Um, or if it gathers leaves and snow and all that kind of bird's nests and all kind of things. So that's why I think, you know, this is most of the time the kinds of dormers that we'll do if it works with the, with the design. And then you have the different kinds of roof planes similar to your main house, gabled with the triangular end. A shed roof is a roof that slopes only in one direction. Uh, hipped, where it's sloping in all directions. Um, you have a segmental, which is round. Um, and then these are called eyebrow dormers. We have some really great examples of these in Bexley. Um, it's, if you go around on your walks, you can look for some of these features. But there's some, we have some great eyebrow dormers here in Bexley as well. All right, so now we're going to start on the homes and 
David's going to give you some information about the history, and then I'll go into the architecture. All right, 303 South Dawson was constructed in 1928 in the Bullet Park edition. It's had a bit of bad luck. In 1974, an attempted break-in. In 1950, a window washer fell from the second story. <laughs> and in 1942, due to the war, they had to substantially reduce the price to make the home sell. Something, I'm told, is not an issue in Bexley today. <laughs> that is for sure. So this house is under the overarching uh, category of eclectic houses. It is a colonial revival based on the date that it was built. It has a side gable, meaning the triangular piece faces to the side, not to the front. And uh, they put an addition, uh, the homeowner put an addition over the porch um, here in 2017. Here you can see some major attributes of a colonial revival house. And one interesting thing, and you can see it in this house, the lower windows are in pairs or triples. Um, you would never see that in an original colonial house because it was structurally too complicated. They didn't have steel to put over the brick um, and things like that. So all of the original colonial houses would have had single windows, where colonial revival typically does windows in pairs. Um, accentuated front door, and again, if you go back, really, really nice entry. It's very proportional to the house. Really well done entry here. Uh, again, original colonial would have had that decoration on the face of the house and not had a porch that pulled forward. And then these are all the subtypes. Again, this is a side facing gable. Here are some revival examples and how they get added to over time because that's uh, certainly in Bexley and in a lot of older homes get added to over time. Um, so here you see the paired windows and here's the original example of a colonial Georgian house. Um, here you see the, the entry at the face whereas this is pulled out more the pairs of windows, and then it's very, very common for these to have uh, a one-story, what they call wings on either side. I think it's interesting to kind of talk about the frequency of some of these subtypes and how they evolve over time. And you can, I don't know if you can read that, but um, it starts in 1880 and kind of continues up. And you see here in the 1920s, introduction of brick veneer. Um, a, an original colonial house would have always had wood siding. So that was something that was introduced later. Um, and you can see here revival entrances, common entrances. They have um, the portico. Um, now, they don't have a curved underside, but a lot of our colonial porches here in Bexley have the curved underside. Um, this is called a pediment, and some of them are broken, like this one and this one but theirs is a solid pediment. <clears throat> 753 Francis was constructed in 1941 in the Hamilton Gardens edition. The first resident was the builder, James F. Schmeider with an M, who built many 1940s Bexley homes and was a member of the Columbus Home Builders Association. In 1942, Wilson Flores Co installed a Bigelow Sanford Beauvais quality Axminster carpet in 18th century floral design with shades of brown, green, blue, and henna on a rose moresque ground and was installed wall to wall in the living room. It was hand sewn. So 
So this is my home. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, um, uh, Jane Baldwin <laughs> bugged me enough that I said I'd have my home. No, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to it for sure. Uh, so this is my home, and unfortunately that carpet is, was long gone by the time I bought the home, so I did not get to see it. Um, the Hamilton Gardens addition is one of the later uh, areas developed in, in Bexley. If you drive down Francis, it really looks different than some of the other streets uh, to the east. Um, and that's because it was, you know, most of the houses are in South Bexley are in the 1920s. This, uh, my home was built in 1941. So historically, a Cape Cod would have been called a folk house. Um, that's kind of where it started. And it was very, very simple. Um, they, call, they started calling it a Cape Cod in the Northeast. You can figure that out. Um, and then it was called a Tidewater Southern, South House in the southern area of the country. Um, it's considered a, oops, huh, okay. <laughs> it's considered a um, modern house. Now, we have to be very careful of the word modern because I'm talking about modern in the time frame, not in the design style. So typically, I use modern when I'm talking chronology, and I use contemporary when I'm talking style. So uh, yeah, my house is considered modern, 1935 to 1950. It's under the minimal traditional subtype with a gable and wing. So this is what my house looks like, although it is, um, the wing is on the left side. So mine's kind of a mirror, mirror of that. Um, interesting, some interesting description of a mi the minimal tradition of houses. It says, simplicity in exterior design gives the small house the appearance of maximum size. And a lot of people will come into my house and say, it's bigger inside than it looks on the outside. <clears throat> The FHA's 1940 version of Principles for Planning Small Houses, which uses the word simple four times in its first five sentences, um, the pamphlet recommends a simple composition, simple roof lines, and simple variations of materials, thus avoiding a restless appearance. I like that description. Um, porches, bay windows, and platform steps were the only additions that the FHA suggested. Um, I was so glad to hear that when I researched it because we added the porch uh, in 2020. It was not there before. We did not have any type of covered opening, so I was happy to hear that. Um, the minimal traditional house was called the little house that could. It was the small house that could be built quickly to accommodate millions of relocating World War II production plant workers from 1941 to 1945. 2080 Clifton Avenue is the former caretaker's cottage on the Jeffrey Estate. It was constructed circa 1926 on land formerly owned by the Nelson family, which had their, who had their home on the west side of Alum Creek on Nelson Road. It is currently the home of the Bexley Historical Society Museum. This is a very simple structure, again, in the modern homes category, constructed 1926. This is a craftsman style house sometimes called arts and crafts, sometimes called bungalow. Most often it's called bungalow when it's a much simpler version of the style. And so I think definitely this caretaker's cottage uh, is, is that exactly. So again, this has a side gable subtype. For any of you that, this, this has been on the tour a couple years, so for any of you that were here last year, 
Uh, I love this, this because it gives me the chance to explain one of my favorite architectural terms. Uh, these little pieces here of clipped roof on the sides of the cottage, and this is, this is just a stock photo, but it, it shows you the, the clipped roof much better than I could get with the um, cottage. That is called a jerkin head, and it may sound strange, it is a very common architectural roof detail found on many homes. It is a gable roof that has been clipped off or cut. The effect is a roof line that folds or leans back onto the ridge. The origin of the design dates to medieval times, but was revived in the late 18th century when old world architecture regained popularity. The original name jerkin head is even more unique than the style. While head refers to the top, jerkin is a reference to a 16th century medieval sleeveless jacket that was worn as an outer garment by men. <laughs> the cut off sleeve concept was then transposed to the gables being cut off resulting in the jerkin head term. There is no shortage of alternate terms including shred head, half hipped roof, clipped gable, and snub gable. The truncated detail has two benefits. One, aesthetic. It reduces the mass of the roof overall, um, and it helps with wind uplift on the sides of the house as well. Two twenty six North Ardmore Road was constructed in nineteen forty in the Ardmore edition. Its resident from nineteen fifty four to seventy three, Paul Walker, was a first member of the original State Board of Education and served from 1956 to 1973 without missing a meeting. So this one is under stylized houses since 1935. Uh, this is American vernacular with a side gabled roof. And you may look at that and say, well, that looks like colonial to me. Looks like, sort of looks like the last one that was colonial. Um, and, and you'd be right, uh, but it's interesting to put colonial revival, which we had on the earlier slide, next to American vernacular um, and see the differences in um, the, the details. These windows are not paired, so this house has single windows. Um, like these are paired, um, much simpler doors and details, uh, much simpler um, cornice at the, at the eave line. Um, Colonial Revival is almost always symmetrical, so this one is shown as symmetrical, but a lot of American vernacular houses are not symmetrical. Uh, interestingly, the most common ex accent to an American vernacular house is a porch. This one doesn't have a porch, um, so that's a little bit unusual. Uh, the way that they described American vernacular, simple geometric forms, the kinds of houses you could build with a set of blocks. Uncomplicated roofs, walls clad with one dominant material, generally wood, stone, or brick, stylistic details not present. And again, porches are the most frequent embellishment on an American vernacular house. In the late 1920s, most American architects were designing eclectic English, Spanish, and French influenced houses. A few architects, however, began to study regional folk house traditions and emulated them in the homes they designed, simplifying houses rather than overcomplicating them. Chief among these was William Worcester in California. And he, does, he said that he designed up from the log cabin instead of trying to compress the mansion. These sturdy, straightforward homes were simple shapes built of native materials and designed to take advantage of both their sites and the prevailing winds. One hundred and seven Ashbourne was constructed in 1928 in the Stanbury Place edition. It was the most costly dwelling house of the year. Its building permit for fifty thousand. 
It was only $5,000 less than the permit issued for Bexley Public Library the same year. In 1936, its resident was the chairman of the executive board of the Jeffrey Manufacturing Company. All right, so this is under the eclectic house category from 1880 to 1940. Uh, English and Anglo-American period houses, Tudor. The sub, so you can see here um, some of the details that would be in a Tudor home. Interestingly enough, Everyone thinks of Tudor homes as having the trim like this on the upper part of the house. It's called half timbering. About a third of Tudor homes actually have that. So it's a very identifying factor of a Tudor home, but you can certainly have a Tudor without that. Um, we have the, the, this house is called a uh, subtype parapeted gables. Uh, again, a great term to talk about. Um, and let me go back to the house. If you can see this right here, the front face of the wall sticks above the roof line. So what is a parapet, you ask? A parapet is a barrier that is an upward extension of a wall at the edge of a roof. The word comes ultimately from the Italian parapetto, to, uh, which parar means to cover or defend, and petto means chest or breast. Where extending above a roof, a parapet may simply be the portion of an exterior wall that continues above the edge of the roof surface, or may be a continuation of a vertical feature beneath. Parapets were originally used to defend buildings from military attack, but today they are primarily used um, as guardrails to conceal rooftop top equipment or as uh, just a decorative item. There's three kinds of parapets. Um, you have the straight kind here, you have a stepped kind here, and then you have the curved kind. Does anybody know what building has the most famous parapet wall? The Alamo. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I didn't know this until I did the research, but this is how the Alamo looked at the battle. It did not have a parapet wall. This is what we all recognize now, um, but that was actually added later. Uh, the battle was in 1836. It was actually a church and a mission, and there was no roof. And the parapet was added in 1850. 819 South Cassingham was constructed in 1926 in the Bexley Plaza edition. The permit was issued to H.L. Bryant, and the architect was Frank Bryant. Its value at construction was $5,000 and the permit was issued for a six-room, two-story, brick and frame with two-car garage. That's interesting, because it's not brick. <laughs> um, this is under, again, the chronology, modern houses, 1900 to present. This is a craftsman house. Um, this would be more considered in the arts and crafts rather than a bungalow. And again, the side gabled roof. We have a lot of side gabled roofs here in Bexley in the, on, the, on the tour this year. Um, interestingly enough, for a arts and crafts house, typically the side gable is not the most common. It's only about 30% of the uh, design. Uh, most are one and a half stories and have shed or gable dormers, which we all know what those are now. Um, However, the side gabled subtype is the most common subtype in the Northeast and the Midwest states. Um, this one that you see here is a little more common um, in the South. So arts and crafts, 
is one of my favorite architectural styles, and, and a lot of that is because of the porches. Really, the porches are most of the time the main feature of an arts and crafts house. And you can see here, um, these are, this is just under the arts and crafts subtype. So this isn't like a general picture for all houses. This is just for arts and crafts. So you can see how many varieties there are, how many different kinds of materials, um, and even the shape of the column, how the porches are built. And I bet that we could walk around Bexley and find every single one of those porch subtypes here. 168 South Cassingham was constructed in 1927 in the Ardmore edition. Resident Ella Gall hosted meetings of the Bexley Women's Club here in the 1970s. <laughs> Sounds like people know who that is. So again, a styled house since 1935, even though it was built in 1927, um, under the new traditional, and this is, interestingly enough, this is a Tudor house, um, but the current homeowner who has recently done an addition, they actually added some elements to make it seem more Tudory. Um, so they added the half timbering that wasn't there before. Um, and I don't know who, but somebody uh, removed all the screens from the front porch, which is a huge improvement in the house. Um, so when we get to new traditional, um, these are some of the different ways that American homes are emulating older styles. And typically, a lot of them have less detail than the original styles, uh, whether it's for maintenance or uh, cost or whatnot, but typically they do have less style or less detail, um, and one of the things that architects are, uh, have been doing is trying to incorporate garages. A lot of these original home styles had no garages. So um, trying to figure out how to put garages on different kinds of architectural styles. And you can see here, the new traditional Tudor looks very similar to the house that's on the tour as well. This actually is the, so we'll get to this later, but this was a digitized picture of this house from the 60s. And uh, you can see here that somebody had um, put the screens around the front porch, um, which is strongly discouraged here in Bexley. Um, and, and you can honestly, you can see why. I mean, this house looks beautiful with the porch all opened up. It's so much more welcoming. 519 South Drexel was constructed in 1923 and an addition was made in 1929. It's in the Parkview addition to Bexley and was originally a duplex. In 1924, rent for the first floor apartment was $125 a month. You can add about $1,000 to that in 2024. <laughs> it had five rooms and a sleeping porch, and the second floor had six rooms and a sleeping porch. In 2014, the garage was demolished, a new porch was placed on the front, and it was remodeled as a bed and breakfast that was purchased in 2022 by Capital University. So this is, again, another Tudor house. They've, they do have the half timbering up here. They've chosen to paint everything one color. Uh, there's lots of ways you can paint a Tudor home and we can see those around Bexley as well. Uh, but this is a front facing gable with a wing is the subtype and it has a jerkin head. Um, <laughs> So it's interesting because this house looks a lot different than the previous Tudor, but if you think about the overall attributes of a Tudor house, it still has all those same characteristics. Um, facade dominated by one or more front-facing gables. 
both houses. Um, decorative half timbering, both houses. Tall, narrow windows, both houses. So a lot of that has to do with massing and form, um, but just, it's just interesting to me how two houses can look different but still be in the same category. So I wanted to talk a little bit before we close up with some other items about home additions in general and the aesthetic for home additions. And I thought this was a perfect example because it is a very old traditional house. Um, when they turned it into a bed and breakfast, they put in this vestibule and the porch roof that are more contemporary. So I kind of wanted to talk about how architects think about adding on to historical homes. And I guess I should say we're not talking about historic preservation of like landmark properties. That's, that's a whole separate thing. But this is just talking about how architects think in general about strategies of adding on to homes. There's basically four different strategies that you can take when approaching an addition to a older home, and they're all valid. The first one is called little, literal replication. The strategy of replication prioritizes compatibility and minimizes differentiation. This strategy will likely sustain the character of an existing setting so long as the historical elements are to be replicated and well understood. The technical means to e effect replication are available, and as the scale of the repli replication is modest relative to the original building. Despite frequently expressed disapproval of this strategy by many contemporary preservation theorists, it has the sanction of history. Architects have chosen to add existing buildings by, re by reproducing a previous architect's work, sometimes even centuries afterward, usually for the sake of completing an intended but unrealized symmetry or extending a pattern already established. In such cases, the resource is defined as the design concept as a whole rather than an isolated part as it appears. You probably recognize this house if you walk a lot in Central Bexley. This is on Powell near Cassidy. Um, so when I was at my other firm, we did this addition here to this house. Gosh, it's been a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. Um, but this is, a, I think, a great example of literal replication. Um, this house has very unique brick, um, not only the, the uh, mostly the way that it's laid up in the coursing, um, and we were able to really effectively replicate that. So this, I think, is a great example in Bexley of literal replication. Strategy two, invention with a style. This strategy, while not replicating the original design, adds new elements in either the same or closely related style, sustaining a sense of continuity and architectural language. The intention is to achieve a balance between differentiation and compatibility, but this approach weighs in the, in the latter, meaning more, more towards compatibility than differentiation. This strategy also has a long history. In fact, it is what most architects have always done through time. So this is Bexley United Methodist Church. Um, I was uh, on the building committee when we did this addition about 10 years ago. Um, and this is a perfect example of invention with a style. We are replicating materials, massing, all that kind of thing, details, parapet walls, um, but we're creating something new that is complementary to the existing. Abstract reference. The third strategy seeks to make a reference to the historic setting 
while consciously avoiding literal resemblance. The approach seeks to balance differentiation and compatibility, but this one has the balance tipped toward the former. So it's a little more differentiation, a little bit less compatibility. This is a difficult strategy to execute because it requires artistry and skill that are not always available. The best example of this is pretty much all a German village. Um, <laughs> They, they have very strict guidelines on what you can do, and their approach is we want to maintain our original housing stock as intact, and then when we do additions, we want to know their additions. This is an addition I did about 10 years ago onto a house on South 5th Street or 6th Street in German Village, but you can clearly see that we're replicating the massing, the window patterns, the roof pitch, all of those kinds of things, but it is secondary to the original structure, and it is also obviously an addition. And uh, like I said, German Village is very clear about that. But to great success. It's like nowhere else. Um, the last one, intentional opposition. The fourth strategy is one of conscious opposition to the context and the determination to change its character through conspicuous contrast, prioritizing differentiation at the expense of compatibility. And again, it's a valid way to go. The best example in Columbus by far is the Columbus Museum of Art. Um, you, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that that is an addition to the original structure. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a great space if you've ever been in there. It's fabulous. They can do different things in there than they can do in the original structure. Um, so for this type of strategy for additions, I think it was, it's very successful whether or not you agree with the contemporary architecture. All right, so one of our resources here at Bexley Public Library for um, researching house history is our Abstracts of Title collection. And we're, we have a goal of digitizing one abstract of title for each addition to the city of Bexley. And Bexley is made up of approximately 50 different additions, um, modern term uh, subdivision. Um, you can see the ones that are colored in, we have an abstracted title for, and those can be viewed in our digital collection on bexleylibrary.org. The abstracted title was a legal document that was required when transferring property until the late 1970s and early 1980s. It provides the history of a property and its transfers and all legal documents related to it dating all the way back to 1803. And if you happen to have a home in an area that's not shaded in and you have a abstract of title for the home, we would love to digitize that. If you don't know if you have it, it would be in the documents you got from a previous homeowner probably, and it's like a book, and it has a whole bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. Um, but it is really important to the history of our community. Another way that you can look up some fun is um, the Columbus Library has digitized their MLS real estate cards and photos from the 1960s. Uh, it's, it's a pretty short time frame. So this year only, well, my house was in there, but there were two more houses that were in there of, of the nine that are on the tour. Um, but it's fun to look up your address and see if you're in there. Uh, this is our Arts and Crafts House, 819 South Cassingham. Um, in 1961, it sold for $18,500. Um, and then the one on the other side, which I had showed you previously, 168 South Cassingham, in 1963, sold for $25,000. This is my house, and this is the digital MLS card of my house originally when it was built, and you can see the difference uh, with the front porch added as well as some other upgrades we've done. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I also have some books up here if you want to look up anything as well.
as you're thinking of your questions, we have some more resources available for researching the house, your, history, your home's history at bexylibrary.org forward slash home dash history. And we have classes. Um, each quarter we'll have a couple of these. So if you can't make it Tuesday, May 23rd at 2 p.m., uh, watch our program guide and website for future um, offerings of this where you can learn about databases used to discover facts and stories about your home, its former residence, and construction. You can register for the program at bexylibrary.org. You'd be amazed how much is out there. Franklin County Auditor, you can look at all the transfers of your property and what everybody paid. Um, Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps, those are great. Uh, the German Village uses those a lot to see what structures are contributing and what are non-contributing, meaning historic. Um, so if you suspect there may have been an old outbuilding on your property at one time, the Sanborn Fire Maps is a great place to go look at that. And a special announcement about August 10th, which is Bexley Day. Join us here at 7 p.m. in the Bexley Public Library Auditorium for birthday cake. Bexley Historical Society trustee Larry Hellman will talk about the history of Bexley and how it developed over time, and a special announcement of a new effort to recognize and mark Bexley Century Homes that are 100 plus years old. The Bexley Day and Century Homes program is made possible by a partnership between Bexley Public Library, Bexley Historical Society, with grant funding from the Page and Mike Crane Fund of the Bexley Community Foundation. And we'll go ahead and take your questions. Um, you talked about the craftsman style and how it was one of your favorites, and it's one of my favorites too. And the front porch is, of course, a huge part of that. Um, and I guess I just wonder, our, our house on Fair Avenue was built in 1940, and there's nothing but a concrete slab, no overhang, where the door is, you know, just part, part of the front of the house. Um, and I'm not keen on that style, but I know that styles came and went and now uh, so if you again walk around Bexley so many houses are adding front porches because we have a lot of architecture that didn't have them right. so it's clearly um, a feature that people are looking for now nowadays um, so did styles just come and go like about the whole front porch thing and people retreated to the backyard and that's why the front porch went away or um, wh what kind of guides that, or is it nothing in particular? They just come and go. <laughs> I think things have evolved so much over time, and I, I think probably one of the main reasons that porches were <clears throat> not done was for cost effectiveness. You know, a lot of these homes were built, uh, we talked about kind of after the World Wars and, and putting them up quick and making them available. Um, I will tell you that since COVID, my front porch work has exploded. <laughs> um, not only front porch, but side porches and back porches. And I think it's great because I think that's one of the best parts of Bexley is the uh, front community with the alleys in the back and the garages and the utility uh, to have all those front porches is really create such a beautiful streetscape. And I've done most of the time, people want to add a porch that is aesthetically uh, sympathetic with their home, but sometimes homes are very, I call vanilla. You know, there's not a lot to work with there, and so a lot of times I use the porch as a way to bring some character to a house that is otherwise really plain. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for attending, and I hope you can make it to the Home and Garden Tour in June, and uh, we'll see you on August 10th for Bexley Day. Thank you. Thank you.